and welcome to the Smart and Sustainable City podcast. Today we talk with Alice Charles. Alice works at the World Economic Forum and is the lead for cities, infrastructure and urban services. Alice has been working at the World Economic Forum for the past seven years and comes from Belfast. In this episode, Alice shares with us some World Economic Forum insights on cities as well as shares some conclusions from a report recently published by the city of Belfast that Alice and the World Economic Forum contributed to. With Alice, I discuss some smart cities best practices from Amsterdam, Helsinki and many others. Okay, if you're ready, let's get started. Hi, um, my name is Alice Charles and uh, I work for the World Economic Forum. Um, by profession, I'm an urban planner and I've worked in the cities and urban planning arena for about 19 years now. Um, first of all, starting my career in consultancy, working for uh, a large real estate consultancy, then moving to an engineering and construction uh, consultancy. But all the while, my, my clients were largely cities um, around the world. And then I moved into government um, I worked for ministry responsible for environment and local government and uh, more recently the World Economic Forum, albeit I am at the World Economic Forum since 2014, so I'm seven years at the World Economic Forum. For those that don't know the World Economic Forum, what does the World Economic Forum do? So it's an international organization for public-private collaboration and we deal with leaders of government, civil society and academia. Um, and what we do is we bring uh, stakeholders together on key issues. So in our case, it relates to cities um, and we seek to get traction. So, for example, we we have work that relates to smart cities. We have work that relates to creating net zero carbon cities, biodiverse cities, financing transition in cities. So we work with multi stakeholders to try and think about how we can solve the challenges, for example, to address climate change or uh, to uh, enable the acceleration of, of enabling technology in cities. Um, you know, in terms of outputs, we often, for example, will produce frameworks to try and guide cities on how they can uh, drive transition. Um, also, we do practical work in cities. So we often do, you know, we take sort of globalized uh, macro efforts and take them to the local level uh, to do work in cities. Um, but also at the World Economic Forum, we work with leaders of industry. And um, one industry that's very connected to cities is the real estate sector. Um, so we very much work with bringing uh, real estate CEOs together with city leaders to think about transforming cities, for example. So at the World Economic Forum, you lead the city and urbanization practice? So um, I lead a number of activities that relate to cities and urbanization. Um, also, there's a number of other programs that relate to uh, real estate, for example, that relate to net zero carbon cities, biodiversity cities. Um, and even we have a work stream now on sustainable timber um, So that, that we're bringing forward. So I guess the most uh, well-known and prominent community uh, of all of those is our Global Future Council on Cities of Tomorrow, which is a think tank focused very much on the future, future of cities. And that um, gathers leaders from the city space from around the world who are leaders in international organizations, cities, business, civil society, and academia. Um, they are essentially a think tank, and we focus heavily on future issues that cities uh, are going to face and create knowledge to try and help cities uh, respond to some of those challenges. And how is that forum or that uh, work linked to the Sustainable Development Goal 11 uh, from the United Nations, um, making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable? I think it encapsulates all of that. So, for example, our, our current Global Future Council on Cities of Tomorrow uh, is pursuing four work programs. One is thinking about the climate and resilience strategies that we must embrace to bring about a green recovery in our cities. And the second is very much thinking about how we can create urban inclusion. So it's recognizing uh, the various vulnerable groups that we have uh, in our cities around the world and the specific needs that they have and how we can create spatial, economic, institutional inclusion and indeed digital inclusion to sort of address those needs. Um, we also have a work program which is thinking through the enabling digital infrastructure to drive a green and just recovery in our cities. And uh, finally, 
you know, COVID-19 has made a challenging situation even more challenging in relation to financing some of those changes. So we have a work program focused on thinking about, you know, alternative revenues and uh, how we can finance a green and just recovery in our cities. So sustainability has three legs to it, right? Economics, environment, and the social dimension. So the, the World Economic Forum is not just about economics. It's, it's also about looking at the environment dimension and the social dimension from what you're saying. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I think that you know we have a long track record in, in doing a lot of work in the social space in relation to cities, and whether that's looking at the impact of migration on cities or uh, you know affordable housing, trying to find solutions to affordable housing in cities, we have a long track record of undertaking work that relates to the social uh, element in city in cities. So you talked about um, uh, COVID-19. COVID um, it, it, it's interesting what we're uh, seeing in the news with, with COVID-19. The pandemic has drawn some residents out of their densely populated cities in some uh, instances. Is, is, have you seen this? Is this a, a point in time phenomenon just driven by the pandemic? Or is this a potentially lasting trend that rebalances the fabric of cities? So I think something that we had seen even before COVID-19 was some of our mega, mega cities were starting to hollow off and people were starting to move to slightly smaller cities. Um, and certainly we've seen that phenomenon continue during COVID-19 where we've seen some people leaving um, mega cities. The thing is, is that temporary or is that permanent? So what we have seen is many people you know, wanting to buy real estate, uh, often in the periphery of the large city in which they worked. And the question is, as we return to work, even if it is in a hybrid model, is that commute going to be sustainable? Are they going to ultimately sell up uh, you know, those, those places that they bought during the pandemic and return to the city? Or are they, for example, going to move to uh, another employer that will allow them to work from home permanently? Um, but if we look at the migration flows, for example, the US released data very, very recently, and it was looking at migration flows out of their large cities like New York or at San Francisco for that matter. But what people did was they still moved to an urban setting by and large, you know, so, so they were maybe moving from San Francisco, but they were going to Austin and Texas. So they were still going to a, an urban setting. And I think that many of those cities that people move to are uh, going to be struggling to provide uh, the infrastructure and services that they require for such a rapid expansion in population. So what I would say is I believe that Cities are not dead. People will continue to live in cities. It, it's, you know, where um, major employers locate because of the agglomeration effects. And I think that, uh, you know, the, some of it will be balanced out. And I really think that some of those people who bought the houses in the periphery of the large city leaving the city will actually return to the city uh, over the next number of years. Right. Well, people were drawn to cities in the past to find security, to find jobs, uh, to find uh, infrastructure and, and culture to, to a degree. Well, we as humans, we're social animals and we like to meet with other uh, humans, right? So, so cities uh, is naturally a place where we come together and we can meet. And um, I, I think that, you know, we find that very difficult, many of us in the pandemic. We must realize many city leaders that we talked to have been highlighting um, the issues that people have been facing in their cities with regard to, to mental health um, because of loneliness and because of an inability to actually meet up with other people. So that desire to want to meet other humans is certainly still there. Of course, people, uh, when they move to cities, it's to live, work and play. But if we think about uh, the work piece, employers locate in cities because they can, there's a, a, a talent pool that they can avail of. And, you know, you'll find tech companies locating beside each other because actually there's an even larger talent pool that they can pick from in that sort of jurisdiction. So that's why you have San Francisco as a tech hub. And that's why you have New York as a finance hub, for example, because uh, they're able to avail of that talent. So I think um, they certainly will be wanting to, you know, to avail of talent in, the, in numbers uh, you know, like they did before. But just one of the things to highlight as well is, you know, I'm very much making a case for uh, that the office is not dead. So I said cities are not dead. I'm also making a case clearly for the, the office not being dead. 
Um, in that regard, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Um, you know, we recently released a framework for the future of real estate, uh, which is looking at how, you know, real estate and, and cities will need to transform um, post-COVID. And one of the things we looked at there was the future of the office. And, you know, we, we looked at the fact that the office provides colleagues, culture and collaboration. Um, we also looked at, you know, some recent research, which was done by MIT. And what that looked at was communication within MIT before COVID-19 and communication in MIT since COVID-19. And for example, what they found was that we were losing those informal connections that we would normally have by having those, you know, random encounters on campus or random encounters at the water cooler and realizing we had things in common and, or we're working on similar things and it would make sense to work together. So we're losing that collaboration that we need to drive innovation. And in, in that context, I believe that's why we will return to work. It may well be a hybrid form. And in that context, I believe that we are going to return to the city. Um, so, you know, I think we will need to come together to work. Of course, our cities are also a place of arts and culture and tourism. Um, so, and, and we, as, as curious humans, uh, want to go and experience different places. So I think we will continue to want to visit different cities. And of course, play. I think one of the things... Um, that we've seen during COVID-19 is the importance of having access to green space. And where people have not had access to green space, we've seen the impact on people's you know, mental health, their physical health. Um, so I think more than ever, as we come out of COVID-19, we're going to see this need to address the play piece and to provide people with adequate green space within our cities. So the mega cities just like the small cities are going to have to think about how they bring biodiversity back, how they create recreational space uh, for their citizens, which of course is good for the environment, but it's also good for our physical and mental health. Right. Our, our workforce, would you say, is evolving and needs to evolve further with a uh, better balance, uh, better diversity? Uh, are, are you, would, would, would you say that cities offer that diversity for, for the workforce? I think cities are a location where people feel comfortable um, being diverse, right? Being uh, in any way, uh, shape or form. And um, definitely often people don't feel comfortable in a smaller location where uh, they are the only person that's diverse in whatever way. Um, whereas in, in cities, they're one of many, so they feel very comfortable in that regard. And also, uh, employers, you know, are becoming increasingly open to having diversity within the workplace. So I think, um, you know, people who already felt more comfortable in a larger urban setting because they're one of many uh, will certainly feel um, comfortable, you know, in the future. But one of the things I do have to highlight is often when we think of diversity, there's uh, one group of of people that we often miss out, and that's disabled persons. Um, and just to say that a lot of our built environment has not been built with disabled persons in mind. So in that context, in terms of integrating disabled persons into our workplaces and into our communities, um, and indeed the homes we create, we need to create uh, a different type of building that's accessible for all and embraces universal design. So basically, you know, meets the needs of all um, rather than what we have in today's society, which is not meeting the needs of all. The workplace won't be a physical place anymore for many. It, it will be digital. It will be, you mentioned, hybrid. So um, I was saying to you about the MIT research and what that basically demonstrates is that we as people need to come together to collaborate and innovate. And in that sense, I believe we need to go back to the office. That does not mean going back to the office every single day, but I think a lot of organizations are likely to adopt uh, a three-day, uh, you know, in the office kind of strategy. Um, why, has, why am I saying that? So one of the things that many companies have found out, and you've probably seen this in The Economist very recently as well, where they were flagging that in fact, people's work days have got longer during COVID-19 but productivity has remained the same. So in essence, it, if we say 
productivity has not been affected. But then on the other hand, we say our days have got longer, then in fact, our productivity is reduced. So um, I think in that context, and we all can testify to that, that there has not been this sort of uh, distinction between what is home, what is work, and work is, is, is managing to, uh, you know, sort of penetrate into our homes. I think people are starting to long for that, um, you know, that balance in their life where there's work, there's home. But even, you know, one of the things about the commute, and of course, there's bad things about the commute, but there's also good things about the commute. And that for many people, that's the time of the day when they, you know, get some exercise and um, they actually get some time to reflect and think about their day ahead, get some time you know, to relax, maybe be away from their families for a short period of time, so they can structure their thoughts. So if some people are even missing the commute <laughs> for the, those very reasons, believe it or not. I, I don't know how many of our listeners will be looking forward to a, a new long commute, but, uh, but let's see. I, I, what, what you're saying is that these... The, I'm hearing you say that the structure of work will might be might be different in the future, where we will need to come to be together, to work together, to collaborate, but it will might be in a different form. Maybe we won't have as many open spaces. Maybe we'll have different days of the week what we get together or reasons what we get together. Yes, indeed, and I think some. Um, you know, if you think about what is the latest research that um, architects are working on, some of them are working on a, a sort of a situation whereby you have the headquarters, but the headquarters that you have right now is slightly reduced in size. Um, and then you have what some of them are calling an outpost or a, a sort of a satellite or a local office. So that is, okay, there's headquarters, but some of the time you're going to be working from home. And you may not necessarily want to work in your home. You might want to work in a local outpost that's convenient to your home so you can still meet other people but they're just from other companies and they're you know it's it's a sort of a area where you can work within your community but also there's this opportunity that you could work from home some of the time so i think you know these are the kinds of thinkings that have been brought to bear in relation to what does the hybrid world of work look like i think certainly in relation to our uh, traditional office layout um, the traditional office layout is likely to change to allow for this greater degree of collaboration. Also, I think, you know, occupiers are now asking for um, a bigger focus, not just on climate, and there was a focus on climate before, but also health and well-being. So our, our buildings are likely to be laid out differently, so they're more conducive to good physical and mental health. Hmm. You've recently been involved in contributing to the Reset for Growth report from the uh, Belfast Innovation and Inclusive Growth Commission. Uh, <laughs> how was that work? What can you tell us about, about Belfast? Wow, okay. Uh, that's well researched, given that it was just released yesterday. <laughs> um, so what was that? Uh, so two years ago, um, the, the mayor of Belfast and the chief executive, you know, the, the Lord Mayor, if you like, is more of a a sort of a, a ceremonial or political role and um, the chief executive in, in the city of Belfast would um, have a much more operational role. Um, so what they decided to do there was set up a commission for innovation and inclusive growth. And that was an independent commission that would guide the city on its future. Um, and of course, Belfast is a post-conflict city. Um, you know, they, they could see the rationale for doing something like this. What it was facing into two years ago was Brexit, and they didn't know they were facing into COVID-19. And what was meant to be a one-year commission turned into a two-year commission because we basically did an added exercise, which was to develop a strategy uh, in addition to the report we, we released yesterday to think about recovery, um, you know, economic recovery within the city. So I guess what we um, it did in, in relation to the commission, the commission was a series of experts, the vice chancellor of the university, um, the head of the chamber of commerce, you know, senior business leaders, senior civil society leaders, um, somebody from a large property development company in, in the UK, uh, myself. So it was a series of, um, I guess, representatives that could um, bring the perspective of different stakeholders to bear. And we worked on a strategy for the future of the city. And for example, 
one of the things that we very much worked on was looking at how you could address climate change within the city. Um, and, you know, it, it's a relatively flat city, but it actually has high emissions. So, you know, we very much made the case for um, retrofitting homes uh, within the city. So if you think about uh, many of the homes that are, have the lowest building energy rating, not just in the city of Belfast, but in many cities, are often um, social housing, um, you know, housing in deprived neighbourhoods. And there's multiple benefits of retrofitting that housing because the people living in that housing are often living in energy poverty. Um, their health is often compromised because of the quality of the homes. You know, for example, there's often high levels of unemployment within those neighbourhoods as well. And, you know, you can upskill people and employ them in retrofitting buildings. So it, it can create a jobs-led recovery. So that was certainly one of the things that we suggested. Another thing that we suggested was, um, you know, infill development within the city. So you cannot have uh, a net zero carbon city if you don't actually have a compact city. So we very much made the case for, um, you know, creating a livable city, thinking about even within the city centre, if some of the, the uses, if, if they're, you know, no longer required, there's a certain degree of downsizing. It's how you bring people back to live in the centre of the city. So that was very much um, a big part of it as well. And the other thing that we highlighted, and indeed this is important for every city in the world, was uh, its global connections with other cities um, and other parts of the world. So in that sense, cities learn from each other. Their context is different, but their problems are, so, are similar. So we were very much making the case for cities connecting with cities. Um, there's also the trade dimension. So we were making the case for the city understanding its international business uh, that's within the city and how the city can help its international business. Um, but also the city trying to attract international business, foreign direct investment, and, and you know, working with other cities to try and, and uh, enable trade. So we're very conscious of Brexit, of course, um, and the impact that it, it, it's going to have on, on the city of Belfast. Um, so it was very much thinking in, in that situation about how you can make it into an opportunity uh, rather than how it, you know, it, it's often thought about that it's, it's a disadvantage. It's really interesting. Many smart city plans that we see have uh, nice intentions, uh, full of political statements. The, uh, the Belfast plan is very specific on the carbon reduction uh, objectives uh, and measurable, quantifiable uh, objectives on carbon reduction. So, so here's my question. The, 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 to become smart or smarters, uh, do city leaders need public, better objectives and metrics? Absolutely. I think, you know, I'm so glad you pointed that out because um, a lot of work, there's a lot of additional reports that we basically did and a lot of additional data that we gathered to feed into that report that was released yesterday. Um, and one of them, for example, was there was a climate commission and the climate commission did detailed work to understand the emissions profile of the city. And essentially what the city did was a mini Stern. So you've heard about Lord Stern and his report. The city did a mini Stern um, to understand its particular uh, issues that it was facing, how emissions had changed over about a 20 year period, how they were likely, if we were to continue on the same trajectory, how they were likely uh, to, to grow. And I think only then were we able to develop understanding what needed to be reduced, what we could do. Only then could we develop a very specific pathway. And one of the things you may have seen within that report is there's not just a 2050 target, there's a 2030 target, there's a 2040 target. So um, in terms of emissions cuts. So I think it could only be done by gathering very detailed data um, and in, in the case of Belfast, it was by having this climate commission undertaking this mini stern, which was able to inform our overall strategy in relation to climate change. Also in the report, what was really interesting was the collaboration that seemed to take place between the private, academic and public sector, uh, which truly represents I believe the will of the city to encompass a stakeholder economy. What do you see in, in that level of partnership in this specific project that you've contributed to in Belfast? Well, I, I think it was 
absolutely needed. So for example, I remember in the early days of our discussion, um, because I come from, uh, you know, I, I was educated in Belfast, I went to university in Belfast, um, and I now work internationally. So, the, you know, there's certain people around the table turning to me and going, well, what do you think we should do? Um, and I was, I was asking the question, well, let's put it back to you. Let's look at the university. Tell me about the leading research that you're doing in the university. Tell me what's happening in terms of what are those researchers doing next? Are they setting up businesses? Are they leaving the city? Why are they leaving the city? So I think, you know, out of those discussions, we were able to establish that Belfast, uh, I didn't know it at the time, is one of the leaders in the world in cybersecurity. It's one of the leaders in the world in advanced manufacturing. So those kinds of discussions where you had academia telling you the latest leading research that was being undertaken in the university, on the other hand, you had the Chamber of Commerce telling you how that's scaling. And, you know, and they also we had, um, you know, Invest Northern Ireland, which was telling us about the foreign direct investment that had an interest in coming into the city. And then I was able to sort of bring in international trends. And of course, we had citizen groups and we had uh, government representatives. Um, we, sorry, we had the city council who, who you know, very much sat in on, on all of these discussions. Um, and the other thing that we did throughout um, the process was we gathered evidence. So, you know, at our, our regular meetings, we would have different stakeholders again come in and present. It was often ideas, pinch points, et cetera, that they were experiencing in the city. And um, so that was able, that, that enabled us to think through what the city needed for its future. Um, and I think also as we were independent, it gave us a certain uh, ability to give clear direction. It, this is a post-conflict city. So, you know, we, we gave clear direction, not based on politics, based on what we thought was best for, uh, for the city's future. I think it was a very interesting model and the city of Pittsburgh did something very similar, uh, turning itself around from a, a city focused on the steel industry, which was in decline, to Eds and Meds uh, a number of years ago. And we know the success story that that was. In Belfast or beyond Belfast, what best practices have you seen which other cities should leverage more of? And whether it's coming from a city or from a, a private company, could you point to a best practice that you think should be more leveraged in, in cities globally? There's just so many. I could pick a different city for different best practice. Um, so one, for example, is how cities are using data. Um, and I'm going to call out two cities in this regard, the city of Amsterdam and the city of Helsinki in particular. But also um, everything I just said in relation to Belfast was based on the data that we collected. So we could, you know, we, we layered data, health data, socioeconomic data, uh, et cetera, on top of each other to get a better understanding of the places that we, you know, were uh, developing a, a proposed strategy for. So if I give the example of the city of Amsterdam, they have the data on every tourist uh, in an anonymous way that enters their city. So they understand the type of tourist that comes into the city, the type of spend associated with that uh, tourist, um, and you know roughly how long they stay, why they're there. So they have been working with the likes of MasterCard to analyze credit card data to get a really good understanding of, of spend within their city, what countries they're from, whether they're male or female, you know what they're there for. And that gives them information on the type of tourists that they want to attract, for example, and they can uh, think about how they can promote uh, advertising of their city to those kinds of folks in the future. So that's an example. Another example is um, Helsinki, for example. So it gathered um, data and created a platform to offer services. And a very simple thing was um, it offered the selection of uh, school places just through a simple SMS. So rather than have to you know, go and fill in forms and it's a bureaucratic process, you, the citizen, they were able to, through data analysis, were able to establish you have a child that's going to be of school going age. You received um, a message which the, they were able to analyze from the data. What was your nearest school offering you the nearest school to where you lived? And you were able to accept that school place or decline in a simple tick 
you know, it responding to a simple message. So that's how you can use data within a city to better analyze your citizens so you're able to offer them very tailored services. But of course, in all of that, um, you have to, your citizens have to trust you. They have to trust that you're protecting uh, their data and you're not compromising their privacy, that you're purely using that data to improve the quality of services that, that you use. So that's definitely a good practice that um, I have to highlight because first of all, from a, a city strategy point of view, you need to make evidence-based decisions. So you need good quality data to make evidence-based decisions. Alice Charles, World Economic Forum, Lead Cities and Real Estate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.